Hello and welcome to Freewave TV. I'm Paige Friedman, bringing you the latest in maritime news from around the world. Today in maritime news, liner schedule reliability sees some improvement since the pandemic began. Tensions between China and Taiwan force ships to look for alternate routes. The ports of New York and New Jersey to implement a fee to decrease the amount of excess empty containers dwelling at their ports. The FMC proposes a plan to gather required information for Ocean Shipping Reform Act. Two ports form a partnership to further their investment and business opportunities. A Chinese shipyard floats out record-breaking container ship. Singapore and Rotterdam are coming together to help decarbonize the maritime industry. Liner schedule reliability has improved on a year-on-year -year basis for the first time since the start of the pandemic in 2020. According to a new report from Sea Intelligence, it would seem that global schedule reliability has broken the trend that was seen since the beginning of the year, with schedule reliability increasing by 3.6 percentage points in June 2022 to 40%. The average delay for late vessel arrivals has been decreasing significantly in the first part of the year, but there was no change month on month at 6.24 days in June. Six out of 10 boxes are also still arriving late to ports. With US House of Representatives Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, ships are being warned to tread carefully when sailing in the Taiwan Strait. The visit has sparked further tension between Taipei and Beijing, and as a result of the visit, China's military has begun a four-day military exercise from noon today at six shipping zones that surround the island. Taiwan's Ministry of Transportation and Communications advised ships to look for other routes to get to Taiwan ports through the remainder of the week. In the United States, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey announced on Tuesday that it is going to implement a new container imbalance fee for ocean carriers in an effort to aggressively move to handle record cargo volumes that have been stimulated by peak cargo season and a cargo shift from the West Coast. This new fee will target empty containers being stored in the port for long periods so that the number of excess empty containers dwelling at the port can decrease, which will create more room for containers that are full of imports and ready to be picked up by cargo owners. The fee is set to go into effect on September 1st. Under the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2022, the U.S. Federal Maritime Commission is required to collect and publish total import and export information from vessel operating common carriers. The FMC proposed it will gather the necessary data monthly from common carriers that transport 1,500 or more 20-foot equivalent units per month in or out of U.S. ports in international common carriage. The FMC is seeking public comments on its proposed plan and is the latest action the Commission has taken to fulfill requirements and deadlines established under the Act. In other news, 80 Ports Group and Hutchison Ports have signed a Memorandum of Understanding as they look to come up with combined investment and business opportunities. Their partnership will have a focus on feedering, logistics, and port activities across the Gulf Cooperation Council, Africa, and Asia, with an initial move to operate within Tanzania. Its goal there will be to improve the capabilities and marketing competitiveness of port operations across the country, including Dar es Salaam port. MSC's newest vessel, the MSC Tessa, is set to be the world's largest container ship based on 20-foot equivalent unit capacity. The vessel was floated out of its dock at Jianyan Chongzing Shipyard this week. With a carrying capacity of 24,116 20-foot equivalent units, the MSC Tessa has beaten the previous record held by the Everlot vessel. In recent years, China's Hudong Zhonghua Shipyard has been coming up with more designs for vessels to continue beating size records. Singapore and Rotterdam have teamed up to create the world's longest green shipping corridor for low and zero carbon shipping. The two ports signed an agreement to establish the green and digital corridor on the sidelines of the World City Summit in Singapore, which takes place every two years. Under the deal, they will look to bring together stakeholders across the supply chain to notice the first sustainable vessels sailing on the route by 2027. And now, here's the news making headlines around the world.
Nancy Pelosi repeatedly ignored Beijing's warnings not to visit Taiwan, the House of Representatives speaker arrived late Tuesday. Starting Wednesday, Pelosi was alienated via 7-Eleven convenience stores and railways, and television's getting hacked with the words, Warmonger Pelosi, get out of Taiwan across the screen. Today, tension in the area skyrocketed as China fired 11 Chinese Dongfeng ballistic missiles miles from the Taiwanese coast. The country also conducted fire drills that are expected to end by Sunday, marking China's defense actions as the nation's biggest ever military exercises in the region. Wang Yi defended China's military drills in the seas around Taiwan, sounding similar to China's Russian allies when he said that eventually it will return to the embrace of their motherland. Today, China continued to defend itself, this time to the G7. In a joint statement, the foreign ministers of the G7 warned that China's escalatory response risked increasing tensions and destabilizing the region, and said it was routine for legislators from their countries to travel internationally. In response, the Chinese foreign ministry canceled a meeting between Chinese foreign minister Wang Yi and its Japanese counterpart during ASEAN events that will occur in Cambodia. Addressing the joint statement, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang scolded the warning, saying that the G7 statement had aroused great indignation among the Chinese people and that today's China is no longer the China of the 19th century. History should not repeat itself, and it will never repeat itself. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken accused Russia earlier this week of using a Ukrainian nuclear power plant occupied by Russia during its invasion on Ukraine but the Associated Press reported Rafael Grossi as the one who requested the Zaporizhia facility get assessed. Russia overran the region in March as a military base to launch attacks on Ukrainian forces. Ukrainian forces claim that the Russians are using the plant to station troops and store military hardware on the grounds, while a Russian official told Reuters news agency that Ukrainian forces were using Western-supplied weapons to attack the plant. The plant is still operating with Ukrainian staff under Russian control. In the meantime, the director general of the IAEA stated that he was attempting to put together a trip as quickly as possible to inspect the facility, but due to the hazards associated with entering the war zone, he required the consent of both Russia and Ukraine, as well as the United Nations. Yesterday, in a late night video address, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky lambasted ex-German Chancellor Gerard Schroeder's comments as disgusting. The ex-Chancellor visited his longtime friend Vladimir Putin just last week and suggested a negotiated solution to the war by giving Russia some of what it wants. Zelensky claimed that the former European leader was at war with European values and working for Russia. This past week, the Ukrainian president described the pressure his armed forces were under in the Donbas region in eastern Ukraine as hell. Today, Ukraine clapped back, saying that Ukrainian defenses were able to dodge multiple Russian assaults on a crucial position in the country's east, with the head of the NATO military alliance adding that Russia must not win this war. In other news, the Taliban, who has been eerily tight-lipped about the U.S. missile attack that allegedly killed major al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawahiri, has addressed the attack today. The Taliban claimed that the government was unaware of the al-Qaeda leader residing in the capital city, Kabul, before urging the U.S. never to launch another strike on Afghan soil. Oswahiri's death in Kabul raises questions about whether he received sanctuary from the Taliban. While some question the entity of government, Kenya is ready for a change as it prepares to elect an entirely new government on August 9th. Voters will be choosing a new president, parliament, county governors, and assemblies as its current president, Uhuru Kenyatta will be stepping down after serving as constitutionally allowed 10 years. Many voters are fed up with corruption and inflation and think it's time for a change. However, Kenyatta is connected to both of the frontrunners trying to succeed him, skewing the path of progress. Local residents from the African region of Kahiso, a township west of Johannesburg, are arming themselves with garden tools and are chasing away illegal miners who fled into mine ventilation shafts underground after angry mobs burned their houses down after 130 men were arrested as part of an investigation into last week's gang rape at an abandoned mine in Goting province, where a group of women were attacked while filming a music video. Those arrested faced charges of illegally possessing firearms and explosives, with none charged with rape. 
Police continued to discourage the angry mobs by firing stun grenades and rubber bullets, but have requested more backup. Giving mixed messages, an official long-term monitoring program reported on Thursday that the Great Barrier Reef in Australia revealed the most coral cover across two-thirds of its surface in 36 years. Although the progress in the central and northern stretches of the UNESCO World Heritage listed reef contrasted with that from the southern region. The report reiterated that the reef is still vulnerable to increasingly frequent mass bleaching. Although this growth shows the reef's resilience, it opens the door to worry about frequencies of disturbance events, especially coral bleaching. As Australia worries about preservation, China's annual climate assessment suggests there might be no going back. The climate assessment published this week suggested that over the past 70 years, China's average ground temperatures increased much faster than the world average and will continue to be significantly higher due to the region's sensitivity. The vice director of China's National Climate Center warned that changing weather patterns in China will affect the balance of water, resources, make ecosystems more vulnerable, and reduce crop yields. China continues to deal with raging temperatures as they reach highs of 44 degrees Celsius and also continues to allocate record-breaking temperatures. As temperatures rise in China, three men sat in the hot seat in Birmingham. Two men and a teenager were found guilty of attempted murder after shooting a 13-year-old boy in November last year, leaving him paralyzed. The two men were Zidane Edwards and Diago Anderson, and the teenager's identity remains undisclosed as he's a minor. The three were found guilty on Tuesday following a six-week trial at Birmingham Crown Court. They are due to be sentenced on October 7th. While some are getting charged, others are only now just getting questioned. A 44-year-old man was arrested in Northern Ireland on what police disclosed as part of an animal smuggling operation. After a raid at Belfast Harbour Estate, police found 57 puppies, three adult dogs, and one cat. The man is being detained and questioned on his involvement in animal smuggling, as local officials claim he is helping with ongoing inquiries. Many questions come as the discovery of six new species of miniature frogs in the forest of Mexico seems to calm. They are among the world's tiniest frogs, growing no bigger than 15 millimeters. The species went undetected for as long as it did due to its size and location preventing researchers from the area due to its cardinal presence. It is believed that the frog species play an important role in the ecosystem as a food source. Because the frog's habitat is declining and they aren't often found, scientists want the species to be classified as endangered. We're now going to take over to Jean-Louis, who's going to share what's going on in the sports world. A stacked day for sports headlines rests on this fine Thursday. Of course, this is Jean-Louis of Freewave TV, and from the States to across the pond, here are your sports stories from all over the globe. Let's start off with a generational talent. The Commonwealth Games Scotland runner Ailish McLaughlin bested the long-distance field to win the 10,000-meter competition, completing a hat trick of gold medal wins for her family. Of course, her mom Liz won the event twice in her Olympic career, winning in 1986 and 1990. When asked about her daughter's triumphant efforts, Mama McLaughlin stated that her daughter's record-breaking 30-minute, 48-second performance was 100 times better than winning the event herself. The stories didn't end on the track field, as the sprint competitions were dominated by Team Jamaica. In the under-20 competition, Tina Clayton headlined the 100-meter competition, retaining her crown and winning gold with a 10-second time. The silver medalist, Serena Cole, her high school classmate, with an 11-second time. Now talk about dominance. Jamaica also bested the 100-meter field in the above 20 ranks as well. Aileen Thompson, hurrah, on of only Jamaica's big three women, showed at the Commonwealth Games and was awarded with the 100-meter gold medal on Wednesday. Now if the country didn't have enough riches, their netball team played spoiler, be beating Australia 57 to 40. The win leapfrogged them atop the pool A of the netball bracket. As if England beats New Zealand today, they'll face Australia once more in the semifinal. Let's shift gears here to football, where yesterday was dominated by the Champions League. 
In the qualifiers, Dynamo Kaviv takes down SK Sternum Graz 1 0. Maccabi Haifa dominates Apollon Lima Sol 4 0. Red Star Belgrade and Buda Glint both win 5 0 versus Pyrenique and Zalgari, respectively, as well as FK Karabakh beating Afrin Tap TC in a 1 1 draw. Today, Europa League takes place with a host of games on tap. The day starts off with A. Key, Lars Arena, taking on Pellersine, Belgrade at 5 p.m. UTC time. Linfield and Zurich matchup tips off at 7.45, with the day ending off with two matches, Olympiakos versus Slovenia, Bratislava, and Tromnak Rovers taking on Shakupri at 8. Now off the field, transfer news is taking center stage as the big timers. The latest news emanates from Chelsea, where franchise brings in middle fielder Carney Chukwuema from Ashton Villa for $20 million. The 18-year-old joins the England forward Raheem Sterling and Senegal defender Kailou Kobali as the new additions for the now rebuilding football squad. In tennis, we got opens taking place simultaneously everywhere, as the Washington Open is currently in full swing. U.S. Open champ Emera Dukanu wins her first round matchup, advancing and potentially getting her rhythm back from her past struggles in recent tourneys. However, the story of tennis goes to Daniil Medev, who after his win in the Los Cabos Open notches his 250th victory. The 26-year-old Grand Slam winner advances to the semifinal matchup today, where he'll compete against Ricardis Bercanis tonight at 8. Back to some track and field news, where the Triathlon World Committee approves the transgender participation policy. The policy indicates that athletes must show a lower maximum level of testosterone, 2.5 nominals per liter, that is maintained for at least two years before the competition. The release also stated that those who competed as a male in any sporting event will have to face up to four years before being participants within women's events. The ruling is to be put in effect next month. Trouble is brewing back at the PGA as Phil Mickelson hosts a headline of LIV golfers filing a lawsuit against the PGA Tour. The news comes after the tour issued suspensions on the golfers as the tour policy has conflicting event releases for overseas tournaments. The players are allowed up to three excused events per year with additional stipulations, of course. However, they declined such releases due to the London event due to their belief that LIV was a hostile competitor. The NFL is expected to appeal the Deshaun Watson suspension, per Adam Schefter. Early on in the week, it was reported that Watson was handed a six-game suspension with pay, despite speculation of a healthier penalty otherwise. The Player Association has two business days to file a documented response to the appeal. And lastly, we end off the day with some unfortunate news, as women's basketball powerhouse UConn loses arguably their biggest star, as Paige Beckers will miss the 2023 season after suffering a torn ACL in her left knee. The former College Player of the Year was hampered by a serious ankle injury last season, leading to her sophomore stint notching only 15 points and four rebounds in merely 17 games as a sophomore. Well wishes to the Husky star. That's all the news we have for you today. You stay locked and loaded to Freeway. We're, of course, on YouTube, Instagram, and other socials to come. Until then, of course, I'm Jean Louis. There's your news.
That's all we have for today. For more detailed news, you can visit our website, www.freewavetv.com. On behalf of all of us here at Freewave TV, thanks for watching, and we'll see you our next newscast. Thank you.